to introduce um, a colleague of mine, um, Pastor Stacy Mills. So Pastor Mills is the executive director of the Racial Equity and Economic Mobility Commission in the upstate of Greenville County, South Carolina. Um, pastor Mills is also the senior pastor at the historic um, Mountain View Baptist Church located in downtown Greenville. And in addition to those roles, if he didn't already have enough to do, um, he's a part of countless um, community initiatives and boards, including the United Way of Greenville, the Urban League of the Upstate, um, the Boys Club, or Boy Scouts, sorry, the Rotary Club, and um, Greenville Organized for Accountable Leadership, with which is a multicultural faith-based um, group working to solve complex challenges in Greenville County like homelessness and mental health. Um, and he is also a collaborator on something that I hold really near and dear, which is the Equity and Public Health Initiative in Greenville County, which is a group of um, community-based nonprofits, including REAM, Hispanic Alliance, and Livewell Greenville, working to address um, structural determinants of um, or barriers to health equity that are really rooted in racism and structural racism. And so I will go ahead and turn it over to Pastor Mills and let you hear from him. Well, good afternoon, everybody. There's a lot of great work that's going on and thank you for um, remaining. Can you just give each other a round of applause for sticking it out today? Yeah, I think that's pretty amazing that you held on until the end and I noticed um, that I had an hour and I assure you that I won't take an hour. After 26 years of uh, pastoring, I've learned that the deacons in the front row really do control how long my sermons go. So I'll pretend that they're here today. I'm not sure what Janisha and Shannon were thinking when they put a preacher at the end of your, uh, at your experience. Well, Melissa, thank you for um, introducing me and being very kind um, in your uh, comments. Um, and when I think about that, um, I think about the um, introductions um, that I've heard over time um, that have talked about um, my engagement in the community. I'm, I'm sort of like Zach now, um, following Brandon, and when Zach followed Mata, it was like, what am I doing here? I mean, all of this good work that's happening in this space, um, and I concur with that. I concur with all that I've heard today, um, but there is so much more work to do. Um, when I think about um, today actually being the anniversary of the funeral for Senator Clemente Pinckney, um, and how our state and even our nation uh, was captivated by an atrocity that happened in our state. Um, I'm thinking also about the formation of um, Greenville's Racial Equity and Economic Mobility Commission that was born out of uh, the fact that a man was killed on the streets in our country, uh, suspected of passing a $20 bill, that person, or a fake $20 bill, which turned out it wasn't a fake $20 bill, and that was George um, Floyd three years ago. In our community, um, our um, leaders, many leaders, decided that we wanted to do something uh, that would decrease the likelihood of Greenville, South Carolina being a Minneapolis, um, and what could we do? And that, that was born out of a conversation between leaders who uh, shared with each other a common purpose, a common cause. Um, and while I've not been asked to talk much about Ring today, um, it certainly frames what I believe is a moment in time. Um, there was a conversation between leaders in our community, um, and, and it began like this, like so many other conversations immediately following George Floyd's uh, murder on national television that we witnessed. And the conversation was, how are you? And the other person routinely responding to that question said, well, I'm fine. And the other person pushed back and said, no, seriously, how are you? And that then changed the trajectory of how we were engaging with each other in our community around 
work like this. And ultimately, it would change personally my life. I would leave two years later, 14 years of serving. I, I, I remarked and said that I'm a reformed employee of USC um, when I was registering this morning. So I knew why they needed certain information from me that I had not um, provided. Um, but I left after 14 years of administration to embark upon this work to help enlighten and ensure, I heard somebody say this earlier, that we were lighting a path and strengthening the work between the grass tops and the grass roots. Um, so I was invited to become the executive director, um, the inaugural executive director of Greenville's Racial Equity and Economic Mobility Commission. After spending 24 months of being sequestered in the Greenville Convention Center looking at policy around income and wealth, education, community-wide learning, uh, and criminal justice, and health and wellness. Um, and I had the good fortune of uh, reaching down to the Low Country in Charleston um, at the College of Charleston and bringing from the College of Charleston's Avery Center for African American Studies my colleague Courtney Hicks, who is here with me today, um, after several months of going at it alone, and I would be out and people would say, hey, have you solved racism in Greenville yet? And I'm like, yeah, you know, about that. Um, yeah. Um, and realizing that that moment that we have is really a moment of consciousness. And so when we think about that consciousness, I reached to where Brandon was a few moments ago, uh, to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in Princeton, New Jersey, Dr. Richard Besser and Dr. Julie Morita of the foundation wrote at its most basic, public health's most critical charge is to prevent sickness and illness by keeping people healthy in the first place. They wrote this in an article mid-pandemic entitled Solving America's Public Health Crisis means addressing historic inequities. And in order for us to actually address those inequities, then we have to admit that they exist in the first place. The next thing that they said that got my attention, and uh, like Brandon, it's rather long, but I do want to read this verbatim. And they went further to say that we must engage the com with communities most affected by racism ensuring that public health departments reflect the communities they serve and that the perspectives of people who have the lived experience of inequity are driving decisions. We will need to retool data systems that form the backbone of public health science so that data can be collected, analyzed, and broken down by age, race, ethnicity, gender, disability, neighborhood, and other factors. A modern data system could have saved lives during this pandemic by allowing us to provide the support and resources in the communities of greatest need. That same system could identify disparities that reflect our society's gravest inequities and in many cases reveal patterns of structural racism. And oftentimes we really don't want to look in the face of what is actually at the root cause of some of the systems that we are dealing with. In my community, I wanted to point out that um, in Greenville, there's just more than a half a million people living in Greenville. And when we break that down into the statistics that you see on the screen and others from the upstate have already mentioned this to you, and I want to tie some significance before um, I take my seat and get out of your way, that 67% or 70% of the people living in Greenville County of that half million people or more are white. 17.3% are black, non-Hispanic, and then 9.4% are Hispanic. Why is that significant? Because the income gap between these populations, this demographic is so stark that it impacts the quality of life that individuals are able to enjoy in Greenville, South Carolina. While that is true, we have stressed over time 
how important education is. If you can just graduate, if you can just get a degree. Well, 83.9% of our young men and women in the upstate are graduating from high school, and that is right at the county's average. These folks represent black and brown students graduating from high school, but still not having the quality of life that their peers are having. So somewhere between high school graduation and full adulthood, there is a disconnect between the philosophy of what education can do and the reality of what life presents. I share that with you today um, because when we look a little bit further um, at these ideas as it relates to health care, this number, 2,944, represents preventable hospital stays per 100,000 um, Medicare beneficiaries in our, in our community. 2,944 preventable hospital stays. Melissa, I'm sure these numbers look very familiar to you. The next one is also astounding because it represents premature death, the premature death rate in our community, upstate, progressive, Greenville, South Carolina, wonderful parks and amazing Main Street, 100 restaurants on a mile stretch of Main Street. You can eat from any culinary delight that you choose, but 11,305.6 people died prematurely in our community. This is the last slide, and I moved because this is a part of my introduction that doesn't always happen um, when speaking on occasions like this. But on April the 8th, my wife woke up and insisted that she needed to go to have a mammogram, her first ever. That was April 8th this year. On April the 21st, as I was preparing to go to the White House, literally in Washington, D.C., at the Watergate Hotel, I was on a conference call with her doctor and my wife, and the doctor patted her leg and said, you have cancer. I'm sorry. And it stopped me in my tracks. What do we do? And so we did what people who have insurance do. We scheduled the next round of doctor's visits. And so from April the 21st, the day she was diagnosed, to June the 6th, just a little over two weeks ago, she had a bilateral double mastectomy and also had the reconstruction begun at the same time. The plastic surgeon said, to us that her general surgeon would remove one breast and then they would switch places and she would go in and put the spacers in and then just matter of factly, they would take care of it. Well, the day we consulted with the general surgeon, I go with my wife and I'm sitting in a corner and as big and burly as I am and as present a husband as I could possibly be, I was helpless sitting in the corner because this had nothing to do with it. And even though my work brings me into rooms like this and spaces like this, oftentimes I feel like I should be able to contr contribute something. And the doctor comes in and he opens my wife's gown and he begins to examine her. And I felt my manhood just slip right down to my feet. Him being a trained physician sensed something and he came as close as he could without violating my space. And he said, Mr. Mills, I'm going not going to treat your wife, I'm going to cure your wife. And I said to him, that's a pretty tall order, doctor. And he said, yes, but one on which I plan to stand fully and would stake my career on it. And so on June the 12th, when we went for the follow-up and um, for the results, um, the pathology report, uh, he comes in the room and he's as bouncy as can be, and he looks at my wife and he says, you got that look because minutes before he came in the room, she said, this is hard. For the first time since April the 12th when she found out that she had to go back for another mammogram, she complained, almost. She said, this is hard. 
The doctor walks in, in what was a millisecond, it had to be. And he came in and he said, you have that look. And he said, we got this. And then he looked at both of us and he said to her three times consecutively, you are cancer free. You are cancer free. And we held each other's hands and I thanked him and I said, man, you're starkly different than you were the first day I met you. And that was because he was so serious and he was so concerned. Why am I telling you this story? I'm telling you this story because we should not be the exception. There are people that we know in our community. My wife was diagnosed on April the 21st. She is right now at home recovering after having had surgery. And I've been there to help take care of her. Today, in fact, is the first day that I've been this far away from her since we had that surgery. And I felt like it was necessary for me to be in this room to tell our story. Why am I showing you our picture? I'm showing you our picture because being a dad is so important to me. Raising our three children. Our, our son closest to me in this picture on this side um, graduated West Point last fall. Um, he's serving his first duty station at Fort Benning, now Fort Moore in Georgia. Our daughter on the other side graduated from uh, Spelman College in 2021, and um, she graduated in three years, and she did so uh, magna cum laude and has zero debt and is going on to uh, NYU in the fall for grad school. Well, I have to tell um, that story so that you can appreciate that Kirsten called me while working at the Prisma Health uh, vaccination clinic during the pandemic because she had collapsed on the floor for some unknown reason and they were rushing her to the hospital. And she said, Dad, I'm on my way to the hospital. And if she were here to tell that story, she said, I said, oh. And the people around her said, is that your dad? Is he coming? And she said, yeah, he'll be here. He's just got to get himself together. And she was right. I'm still getting myself together because we weren't prepared for that. And we went to the hospital and she was there. We discovered that she had something called severe idiopathic aplastic anemia. I can say these terms now because prior to that, I knew nothing about what that was. Prior to the doctor telling my wife that she had uh, an invasive ductal uh, carcinoma in situ or whatever all of that was, I had no knowledge of that. I graduated college. I've worked 14 years at a university. I've served 26 years in a community pastoring a church. I had no idea and was not prepared. Can you imagine folks who don't have that background, whether they're prepared or not? I tell that story because my daughter did overcome. She needed a, a bone marrow transplant. And I thought that this oldest knucklehead would be her match. And, and he wasn't, so then we tried the second knucklehead and he wasn't a match either, and, and for good reason, because he told her, if I'm a match, I'm gonna ride you forever and tell you <laughs> that I saved your life. And he would, he would have done it. He would have done it. He's a senior at Greenville High, and I tell the story about my accepting the role as the executive director of Rain um, because of Zion. Zion's our baby. We were on our way to school during the pandemic on those A days or B days that Greenville County Schools had come up with, and I don't know what that looked like in your community, but I enjoyed driving all three of them to school at the time that we needed to be able to drive them to school uh, because that was my time with them, and no less was the case with Zion. And I finished with this. I finished with it because we were at the apex of the Church Street Bridge in downtown Greenville, and we were looking out, he was looking out over our city, and I was on a board meeting call because all of them were Zoom or Teams or whatever, and I could do that in my car. And so I was doing that while I was driving him to his A-day. And he reached over and he pressed the mute button because he had gotten accustomed to needing to get my attention by pressing the mute button <laughs> in the car and saying, yo, dad. And so he said, yo, dad, I think we live in a pretty good community. And I said, son, you mean our neighborhood? We've got some good neighbors. And he said, no, 
I mean, our community. I'm, I'm thinking, man, we're at a pretty good spot. The sun's up and we're looking out over the city of Greenville. Nice buildings, beautiful things are happening. Maybe that's what he means. I said, you're talking about those buildings and that church that sits right down there? Beautiful landscape. He said, no. He said, it's the people on that call. We were talking about in that meeting the fact that there are no restrictions to charging people three and four hundred percent interest rate on personal loans. Um, unless you're in the military, and then it's capped at like 27 to 30 percent. And my then 15 year old son pauses our drive to school to say to me, we live in a pretty good community, and I ask him why. He said, because I think the people on that call could probably afford that interest rate, but they're concerned about people who can't afford the interest rate. And that's the discussion in this meeting on the call. And he said, I think we live in a pretty good community. Well, the year before that, I was serving as the chairman of the Citizens Police Policy Review Board. And we were examining policies in Greenville law enforcement that had to do with police brutality, excessive force, use of dogs, the number of stops, the number of arrests. And I said, if my brown skin 15-year-old, lanky, football-playing son with this crazy hairstyle <laughs> believes that we live in a good community, then I need to give myself every day to making sure that that's accurate. And like Sam, you know, listening to his testimony today, it, it brought me to a place um, because you guys remember the movie, The Pursuit of Happiness? I watched it one time and I could not watch it again. Because when that movie came out, Will Smith and his son playing those roles, my children were far younger and much smaller. And I was scared that one day that could be me in a terminal trying to take care of my kid and keep him from knowing that we're homeless. And today, they're up some size. This one has its own place. The one on the far end has already secured her apartment in New York downtown and said, Dad, no, you don't get a key. I'm going to grad school. You don't need to come. But guys, we cannot be, the Millses cannot be the exceptional Negroes or the exceptions to the rule. This has to be an increased opportunity for more people in our community to be able to gain access to quality health care. It should not be that we have social capital that gets us in to see a doctor and get a surgery. Or when we couldn't get a, a, a bone marrow transplant between siblings, a genetically modified bone marrow was ordered immediately and my daughter was put in the hospital and her life was saved and her her care team said, we want her to get out of this hospital and go live her life. She completed her senior thesis from the ICU on the Peds ward at Prisma Health. They took care of my daughter. And as Dr. Nicole Bryant likes to say, we're going to tank her up so that she can go graduate in person. And she did at Spelman College, who held their graduation that year on the football field at Georgia Tech. And we watched her get her degree, magna cum laude. So I want to say to you today, what you do is worth it. What you do and what your colleagues are involved in really makes a difference. It makes a difference for families like mine, but it also makes a difference for other people who need to reach a little bit deeper to have a better quality of life. That's my time. Thank you very much. It's kind of hard to ask questions. I, I saw Heather wiping away the tears. I was the same way over here. I'm like, I don't want to talk after this. Y'all, this is 
this is it. This has been an amazing day. Um, I just really appreciate you all being here. I had two questions. Raise your hand if you met someone new. Awesome. Great. And then my second question is, did you get any good ideas today that you're going to put in your back pocket and take with you? Raise your hand. Good. Amen. That's really what we hoped would happen today, is that you would make some new connections. It's a lot about this work, right, is our partnerships. We've talked a lot about that today. It's about taking innovation and thinking about how you can take that home with you and do something new. Um, I want to appreciate you all being here today. I hope you got enjoyed celebrating with us. I want to thank all the core members again. Y'all have been such a blessing to work with over the past year and a half. I really appreciate every single one of you. We are not going to stop. We're going to keep moving. I got a writing group. I'm going to keep busy for about six months so we can start putting this plan into place and start fun, finding funding, funding to keep this work moving forward. But again, thank you guys for being here. Thank you to all our special guests for sharing what you do. It's I learned so many new things today, and it's just been such a blessing to be here with all of you. So y'all take care, drive safely, grab a water on your way out. Thanks again.